there was one study, I, I don't know which institution it did in San Francisco, found that neuron, new neurons can even grow through the use of psychedelics. So if that is true, and they found that, but if that is you know proven by other studies, it would basically mean you take psychedelics and you grow more neurons in your brain. I mean, you can basically, you know, just have to tell that to Elon Musk and you know, he will, he will, <laughs> he will go nuts about it, you know. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Change Agents and Ironclad Original, presented by Firecracker Farm. Today's episode is with researcher Norman Oler. He has written extensively about drug use in Nazi Germany, and he has recently turned his attention to the history of LSD and its potential to treat conditions like Alzheimer's disease. Norman is a best-selling author, journalist, and screenwriter, best known for books including Blitzed, Drugs in Nazi Germany, the Bohemians, and his latest book, Tripped, Nazi Germany, the CIA, and the Dawn of the Psychedelic Age. Let's dive in. Let's go back to your first book, Blitzed. The subject of Nazi drug use, probably not something that uh, most people are thinking about on an average day-to-day. -day. I'm just fascinated by what got you interested in that particular subject to begin with. Um, I had a friend who was a DJ in Berlin and he told me that the Nazis used a lot of drugs and that I should write about it. I thought that was kind of curious information because I was, when I received this in 2010, it wasn't really known. Uh, no one really thought of made a connection between Nazis and drugs. Um, my grandfather always said the Nazis were very disciplined system, it's a law and order system, so you wouldn't really intuitively connect it to drugs. So my friend surprised me and then I did, I mean, he found old methamphetamine tablets in an old, um, his friend found them in an old apartment in Berlin from the forties and they took them and the methamphetamine was still active. So that's, that's how he came <laughs> to the conclusion. And um, then I did some research. There was a bit online, but not much. I was one, um, PhD for medicine history from a Southern German university. He had done some research. I met him and he pointed me to the right files in the, in the, in the, in the military archives of Germany. And from there, and there I started my research. Was there a good volume that you had access to? Like you said, it wasn't really talked about as you started digging deeper. Was it pretty easy to put the pieces together? Um. There had been one book published in Germany, it's called Nazis on Speed, but it's not really a comprehensive narrative of what happened in the so-called Third Reich. It's more like a collection of documents that this author had found. So that was also a starting point. So I tried to, I kind of created the first narrative of how it all, what role it played in the society of National Socialism and how it you know, I was, I wrote the first history about it. You could say there were like tidbits known here and there. And I put it together and also did, uh, I mean, most of the stuff in Blitz, the research that I did then in the archives were, because if you find something, it can, you know, dig deeper, mm -hmm. gives you, if you have some kind of reference, um, cause the archives are vast places you have to know where to look for what and then you might find something what role did it play in the rise of the national socialism specifically with nazi germany well the main role it played in the military was that it allowed the german to not sleep for three days and three nights advance without stopping which was unheard of at the time 
and really surprised the British and the French um, troops that were trying to protect Belgium and France, basically. Um, the Germans developed, well, there were three tank generals, Guderian, um, Rommel, and von Manstein. They were kind of the young revolutionary tank generals, and they were able to secure the so-called working breakfast with Hitler on February 17th, 1940. And Hitler wanted to attack the West, but he had the problem that he didn't have a strategy. His generals actually refused to work out a strategy, or they said there is none, we cannot win this, because we need a three-to-one superiority if we want to launch a successful ground invasion. Um, and there was, you know, the German Iron der Wehrmacht was actually inferior to the combined Western forces of France and Great Britain. So there, w there was really no way in a, in a way, uh, but these three tank generals, they saw a way out, which was to concentrate the forces, um, at the Arden, th go through the Arden mountains, which is a mountain range in Southern Belgium, which was not heavily fortified because the Western allies didn't think that any army, or, I mean, that the German army could not go through the eye of a needle because it takes too long to move a whole army with tanks and everything through the mountains because you have to set up camp, you know, at mm. night, whatever. And then they, you know, they can, they thought no one thought it was possible, but they, they said, we have, we can do it, but we have to get through the mountains and to the border of France, through Belgium, basically I cut through Belgium and get to the border of France within three days and three nights. And then the allies, which were stationed in the north of Belgium will not be able to come down quickly enough to destroy us. And we will kind of be already in enemy territory before they know it. Basically, we will be behind that back and then can cut them off. This is what Churchill, after it had been really successful, called the sickle cut. So the problem only then was, I mean, Hitler, said, Hitler, Hitler loved his plan um, on February 17th. Because he said, of course, the German soldier can stay up three days and three nights because the German soldier is so convinced of his, you know, he's superior to the other. He's a superhuman, so he doesn't, he could do this. But this was basically just uh, ideology uh, because the German soldiers were as human as the Belgian or French soldiers. But the German soldiers had another amphetamine, which Hitler didn't know actually. Um, but the guy who had developed methamphetamine as a program for the Wehrmacht, who was responsible for performance enhancement of the German army, Professor Otto Ranke, when he heard about the new Aufmarsch plan, the new plan to invade the West, he made it known to the surgeon general, I mean, he was not called surgeon general, but his superior that methamphetamine should be used on a, on a, on an official, you know, level and should be distributed. And then it would be possible that they wouldn't have to sleep because methamphetamine, he had made tests before in the medical, um, academy of Berlin with young uh, medical officers, uh, where he tested methamphetamine versus caffeine with versus benzedrine, which was already on the market in the American product actually, but which was not used by the army. But it was on the market as like a nasal spray, I think. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's an amphetamine, but methamphetamine is much stronger. So he had concluded that methamphetamine would be able to, um, to get, to give you that stamina to fight for three days and three nights. And he was actually hurt, so um, he had to write a stimulant decree that it's as it was called, which I found also in the military archive, which told every medical officer once the attack against the West start to give three milligrams of uh, pure methamphetamine. And then after, I think, six hours or something says in the document that the next dosage, so you would be continuously awake for three days and three nights and 35 million dosages were purchased by the German army for by from the Berlin-based Temla company who produced the methamphetamine, which they labeled as pervitine, pavitine. And, uh, that, that 
attack worked, you know, France, you know, they overrun uh, the the French and British forces within days. Yeah. Uh, you know, Rommel ran to the channel and uh, Paris was taken within, I think, 17 days or something like that. The so-called strongest army in the world, the, the, the French army was like uh, ridiculed uh, by the German met, you know, monsters. So this, I think this, this is the major, um, a major success of the German army because, not because they used methamphetamine, but because they had a strategy that they could successfully carry out, but only because they used methamphetamine, they could co carry out this strategy. So that, I think that is the main part of it. Did the soldiers know what they were taking? Did, were you able to find out what they were told or were they just told, hey, you're going to take this and then here's your second dose? Well, it was not mandatory to take it, but Pavitin was quite known in the German civil society before the war started. It was like if you would you know, act today Ritalin or you okay. know, people knew it, but, um, and it wasn't considered to be a drug. It was just considered to be a performance enhancing medicine or uh, something that kept you going. So for the soldiers, it was kind of natural to take it. I mean, it was just like, you know, go pill. Um, so I didn't read a, I mean, there were some people who complained, like didn't want to take it, didn't like it, but most people liked it because it's a, it was a great pill, you know, mm -hmm. to take it, you're more, you know, you have more courage, you have more energy. There's no reason not to take it, that all your pals take it. So people took it. Um, and I mean. I read the letters of soldiers where they, before that, in the attack against Poland, it hadn't been official yet. It had, you had to bring it yourself. And there were, there are famous letters by one soldier who later became the Nobel Prize winner for literature, Heinrich Böll. And he wrote, the, his letters are, you know, in the, like, they're known, you know, because everything he writes is known because he won the Nobel Prize. So he wrote to it as a 19 year old soldier. From the front, uh, when he was not a writer yet, but just a soldier, he wrote to his parents, like, send me more Pevitin, I need it. I get to press <laughs> when I don't take it. And I spoke to his son later. I mean, of course, later. I mean, mm -hmm. I spoke to his son in the 2000s. And he said that his father actually still used Pevitin in the 50s and 60s in the evening. When the kids were finally asleep, he would pop a pill of methamphetamine. And, um, write, you know, write his books. Wow. I know we're going to talk about, um, psychedelics, specifically LSD and potential, uh, medical uses of that in the future or, you know, in a few minutes here, was there any research that the Germans were doing around psychedelics back at this time around the time of world war II? Well, I found, um, a two page document, um, that had been done by an American and it took me a while to figure out how it came about, but basically the SS did a psychedelic test in the concentration camp of Dachau and the, the papers, uh, about these tests were being confiscated by the U S military when they liberated the camp hmm. and was sent to Harvard university where a professor, um, Beecher, uh, was working and was also the military advisor to the United States in terms of drug. He was the drug advisor to the U S military. Um, and he wrote, uh, like he wrote a, a conclusion, uh, about the, not the experiment, but the original document that must be somewhere in Harvard. I have not been able to find yet, but I will, I'm still looking for them. I want to see the actual, like, I don't know, hundreds of pages that the SS did or maybe only 50 pages, maybe they're destroyed. I don't know, but they should be at Harvard. I don't, I don't see a reason why they would be destroyed. Um, they might be buried somewhere. You can't find any, anything in the archives. If it was like, if it's like put in a raw folder without like labeling, you'll never, no one's ever going to find it you know, yeah. basically. Um, so yeah, they I did some tests in, in Dachau, uh, that their, their attempt was to destroy the will of a person through, through a uh, pharmaceutical mean, like you give someone a drug unwittingly, huh. uh, in order to destabilize the person and disrupt his or her ego, um, that they wanted to use that against Polish resistance fighters who had been resist 
acting even uh, at, at and Gestapo torture. So you couldn't torture them as bad as you wanted. They still wouldn't talk. So that created frustration on the side of the SS and the Gestapo. That's why they were looking for a so-called truth drug, which they thought maybe psychedelics could be. Yeah, I had heard that uh, Hitler had a preoccupation with finding this truth serum. I didn't realize it was through the lens of psychedelics. It's interesting. Um, well, they started with other substances, um, but they weren't very successful. Like they didn't know it would it could be psych- psychedelics, which is one option. They had yeah. a- other stuff that I didn't research so well. Like it's like one chemical that was often used back then. It's like forgotten that often doesn't work. There's no, so far, no one has been able to find a true drug. It's like a fantasy. Yeah. Well, unless you watch movies and take them seriously. Ladies and gentlemen, do you need a gift idea for somebody that you love or do you just want to treat yourself? Well, I have one for you. Firecracker Farm Hot Salt is an absolutely awesome gift. It is delicious. It's handcrafted. It's beautifully packaged and it's unlike anything else that is out there. Everybody who tries it absolutely loves it. Firecracker Farm has different flavors and heat levels like Pineapple Express and hotter stuff if that's what you're into and their limited run buddy batches, the Apocalypto and Snake Eater. There's something for everybody. It's made with love and a percentage of every sales goes to OP300 and the Pipe Hitter Foundation. There is one drawback and that is you might not be able to get them. Firecracker Farm is a very small family business and Alex can only make so much at a time. So there is a chance that they're going to run out. And once you get your hands on one of these grinders, you're going to understand exactly why they can't make them in batches. This is a handcrafted grinder with an amazing salt inside of it. If cost is your main concern, worry not. There are hundreds of thousands of servings per package, which is way cheaper than any sauce. And it's not going to over flavor like a lot of sauces traditionally do. If you are ready to upgrade your culinary game and get your hands on one of these amazing grinders yourself, use the code IRONCLAD, all one word, all capital, to get 15% off your first order at firecracker.farm. What about Hitler himself? Um, There are some interesting videos that people will point to where he is unable to sit still. It seems like there's some pretty prominent historical videos with him kind of like shaking and rocking. What kind of drug use was Hitler? I'm curious, probably at the beginning of the war or even pre-war towards the the tail end, did his drug use increase? Yeah, it increased. Um, He was portrayed always as a teetotaler who didn't smoke, no coffee, no alcohol, of course, no drugs. It's unthinkable. Uh, He was portrayed almost like a saint that would have no private life, would only you know, dedicate his life to serving the German people. That was kind of the image. And um, up until like 1941, that was, I mean, the image, of course, was not the reality, but the reality, it, in fact, was that he did not take any drugs except daily vitamin shots that he received from his personal physician, Theo Morel, which was kind of innovative at the time. Like no one would use, do, no one would do uh, vitamins like we all do today. Yeah. Um, but he did it. Hitler did it. So because he, because his personal physician knew it's good. The only weird thing about it is that he gave them all intra, intra most of them intravenously or in, in, into the muscle, but most, most, mostly intravenously. So it's hmm. a bit intense, you know? Yeah. With vitamin. Or an injection, but Hitler liked injection uh, for some masochistic reason, um, or even self-destructive reason, because his actually vein were scarred toward the end of the wa- war because he had received so many injections. Like a junkie, he looked um, his arms. Um, why he always had to cover them with the uniform. So um, in forty-one, he was. From 36, when he met uh, Theo Morel until 41, five years, uh, he received over a thousand injections and was basically always healthy. Um, that's like the Hitler we n- kind of know in good shape, like when he gives speeches and be charismatic and like yell at yeah. crowds and all that stuff. 
So there's one video from 1936 Olympic Games where it's like shown shaking. Somehow I think it's a fake because he was in good shape back then. Oh, interesting. Uh, so I, I don't really believe in that video. Um, but in 41, he started to use an opioid for the first time, a German opioid called, called Dolantine, which was helping him to get out of bed when he had contracted a severe flu in the in August of 1941 during a crucial time in the campaign against the Soviet Union when he wanted to divide the troops north into Leningrad and south to the oil fields of the Caucasus while his general high command wanted to go straight to Moscow and capture the capital. And he was sick like when that decision had to be made, you know, and it was, a, you know, in the moment it had to be decided. So, and, you know, German, Germany, even not to Germany, especially the military, the military was not a Nazi organization. It was the, uh, the, the country's neutral military, you know, the Wehrmacht, the country's military. So they, I mean, Hitler was the highest command, but still it wasn't like, he couldn't like do anything with, that he wanted with the military. The military yeah. had its own will. So he was really afraid that they would make decisions while he was in sick bed. So he asked uh, Morel to give him something strong and vitamins. And Morel gave him this opioid, which enabled Hitler to get out of bed. He, that fever was gone. And he, you know, was functionable. And his biggest fear was always was that he was not able to make every decision, you know, because he was, you know, always, he was like. Control freak? Like, yeah, it was a total control freak up until like, you know, the meals of the soldiers and all that kind of, you know, he was just a control freak, uh, wanted to order everything. So for him, it was unthinkable that such a big decision would be made without him. So he took the opioid and the opioid helped him and, um, it kind of gave him the taste for opioid. And later he tried in 43 for the first time, an opioid called, called Oikodal, which after the war, the patent uh, was locked by Germany and uh, was then repatented as uh, oxycodone, oxycontin, not oxycontin, but oxycodone. Yep. It didn't have the time release, but it was the, it's the same thing as the German invention. It, um, so the opioid crisis in America is kind of a a late gift from uh, from from Nazi Germany uh, to be. It's <laughs> one way to look at it. Yeah. Um, so Hitler liked oikodal very much. He, he received it in intravenously in quite high dosages up to 20 milligram um, on a day-to-day -day basis in 44 at, at, at certain times, especially after Operation Valkyrie um, when he was uh, quite injured actually and needed painkillers or opioids are great painkillers, you know, uh, because he had hundreds of splinters in his body. And um, so you could, you can kind of see how it, the drug use accelerate and, and, and get out of hand and he can't control it anymore. And then, you know, the drug abuse kind of works against him um, and turns him into this physical wreck because he not only used opioids, which I guess, I don't know. I don't know how, if they ruin you physically, I mean, you might die from them, but I don't know if they're, they also turn you into a physical wreck, maybe. But yeah. he also consumed a lot of hormone concoctions that his personal physician made in his own lab, um, like pig's liver extract that he got shot intravenously and weird things. Uh, he was he was very experimental. Like he was curious about new medicines that his personal physician would make would come up with to increase his performance. Did he ever, did he ever use methamphetamines as well? Or did he stick more with the opiates? I, you can only go from the note of, of Theo Morel, which are kept in the federal archives of Germany. And they, those are the only notes about Hitler's, um, drug and medicine use, but because Morel gave it to Hitler, so he wrote everything yeah. down, but maybe he didn't write everything down that we don't know, you know. He, you know, he'd give, give a drug. He don't write it down. No one will ever know. But he does give in his notes methamphetamine, but only two times. Hmm. So I think because he does write it when he gives it, I don't have a reason to 
to spec that he gave it like every day and wrote it two times. It doesn't make sense. Either you write it every time or you don't write it or you write it maybe 50 times if you give it 200 times. But writing it two times, I think he actually only gave it two times. Um, I think Hitler didn't like methamphetamine. So also I think this video at the Olympic Games 36 where he's like Matt kind of rocking like if he was like twitch nervous. Yeah. That's why I also think it's fake. Interesting. Because he never used I don't think he ever used uh, methamphetamine, but there's different voices. Like there was one SS doctor. So Hitler every day received um, a little bar of that Morel personally made in his factory. And they were called multi, Vita Multin, which is a multivitamin bar. Not chocolate, but some kind of sweet thing with like vitamins in it. And Hitler ate one of these things every day. And one at at doctor once claimed that Morel put methamphetamine into these bars, but it's just this one guy claiming it. And he said that he actually took one bar once and had it analyzed in an SS laboratory. And the report came back that it contained methamphetamine. And then he locked the report, which you kind of, <laughs> so I don't, I don't really believe in it. Hard yeah, to he verify. He was an SS guy. Yeah. Huh? Hard yeah, to verify. Yeah. Impossible. They're very impossible. Well, Unless you would find that original SS report from the lab, but I, I don't think actually it exists. What's going on, everyone? This episode is also brought to you by Allegiance Gold. Recently, we've witnessed a surge in gold prices, reaching an all-time high of shy of $2,500, an impressive 20% increase in less than a year. In a market where traditional investments are increasingly scrutinized, gold and precious metals have emerged as compelling alternatives. You may ask, why should I invest in gold? Well, I'll give you a few reasons. Gold has long been valued for its stability and ability to preserve wealth across generations. It's a low-risk investment that provides security and balances out more volatile assets, especially during economic downturns. With the U.S. dollar weakening due to rising national debt and inflation, gold acts as a reliable hedge, increasing in value when the cost of living spikes. Furthermore, it remains a crisis commodity that retains worth in times of geopolitical turmoil, as investors often turn to gold when global tensions rise. Finally, gold is a private, tangible asset, offering discretion and liquidity in a digital age prone to data breaches. If you are interested in learning more, go to protectwithandy.com today. Listeners of the show will get an exclusive lowest pricing on the market for select gold bars. That is protectwithandy.com. That'll be in the show notes. Or you can call 844-790-9191 to talk to an account representative. So you mentioned, uh, you know, this this desire to try to find a, a truth serum or a way to break people pharmacologically. The U.S. takes that information. Um, we can fast forward into U.S. history a little bit. CIA Operation MK Ultra, where they decided to maybe disperse a little bit of LSD to unwitting uh, individuals inside of our own society. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, MK Ultra, what it is that they were trying to do? I mean, MK Ultra is pretty much written about in the in the literature already, but what no one I think is really uncovered are uh, its German origins, its German roots, mm -hmm. which are those very drug psychedelic drug experiments in the concentration camp of Dachau. Because um, when the US, the U.S. liberated or occupied Germany, um, I would say liberated. Uh, most people would actually, um, not just with the occupied Germany. Uh, they had a military unit had units attached. I don't know if you've ever heard about it called Alsos, mm -mm. A-L-S-O-S. Um, Alsos was a secret unit made up of military personnel and scientists. Uh, young, you know, people who knew about science. And their, that job was to interrogate German scientists in regards to nuclear technology. And the side project of Altos was to also interrogate German scientists about um, bio biochemical technology or knowledge. And um, 
I mean, out of this, these ALSOS report came or Operation Paperclip kind of used also that knowledge from the ALSOS reports to decide like which scientists are actually valuable for America, like Werner von Braun. We then created, you know, the missile program, not created, but inspired, maybe did create it, you know, probably both. I mean, he was with, without Werner von Braun, the rocket science of the United States would have been, you know, lower. Yes, you know? for sure. <laughs> for sure. So when they, when the Americans set up headquarters in Heidelberg, um, they found a biochemist who had worked for Hitler named Richard Kuhn. Who was living in Heidelberg? He was the professor for biochemistry in Heidelberg, and he had been uh, working on the truth drug. And he had uh, been friends with the CEO of a Swiss company called Sandoz, who had developed LSD in 1943. So in 43, this Nazi biochemist had already heard of LSD, and he was also responsible for. Um, you know, informing the SS test in Dachau on the record, on the paper that Beecher from Harvard uh, compiled, he only writes that the Nazis used mescaline and one other tasteless, odorless, hallucinogenic. And I I think it was LSD because Kuhn, who was in, in touch with the SS guy Plötner in the concentration camp, who did the experiment, Kuhn had received... Um, Ergonomine, which is the precursor to LSD from Sandoz, the Swiss pharmaceutical company. In October 1943, I found a paper where he writes to the Swiss CEO, thank you for sending me half a gram. Um, so, uh, I mean, Kuhn knew about LSD. That There's also another proof that he actually knew about LSD was that he told the Americans about it. And the American military became, at that point in the spring of 1945, immediately extremely interested in this potential truth drug that the Nazis were curious about because the Cold War was already starting, which was a war of the ideology, the war of the mind. CIA was founded in 47. CIA Director Dallas said this is brain warfare against the Soviet Union. He set up the program MK Ultra at that moment. The U.S. military drug program kind of fell into the lap or was transferred over to the CIA to MK Ultra, which was headed by Sidney Gottlieb, who was a guy from the Bronx, basically, who had, you know, smart guy who had studied uh, bi biology and joined the CIA. Then he was the head of MK Ultra, and his job was to see if LSD, you know, basically continue the um, not the experiment and find out whether LSD could really be used as a, as a truth drug or as a drug against the Soviet Union, contaminating the water supply of Moscow, or like he was examining all the questions. So that is MK Ultra, and it, those are it's not the German origin. Attention warriors, are you ready to push your limits and become a stronger, more resilient version of yourself? We've teamed up with Mountain Tough Fitness Labs to deliver a fitness program designed for those who live by the creed of excellence. Whether you're active duty or a veteran or a hunter or just someone who's ready to tackle the challenges life throws at you. The Mountain Tough app is your battlefield for building mental toughness, physical strength, and it isn't just a workout program. It's a mission to forge you into a higher performing athlete prepared for whatever comes next. We are so confident in this program that we're offering a full year on the app for just $120. Use the code CYBER50, that's all capital letters, all one word, at www.mountaintough.com. That breaks down to just 33 cents a day. Think about it this way. Investing in your fitness is one of the few things in your life that you can control. If you wanna be the best, it starts right there. Dig in your truck seat, find the spare change, and commit to your mission of strength and resilience today. There is a redemption link down in the show notes, and the sale starts on the 22nd of November. And the promo code could only be used 1,000 times. First come, first serve. See you there. What kind of uh, testing did they do? I'm not, I mean, I'm familiar with the umbrella program of MK Ultra and what it was, but specifically, how were they getting people LSD? Like, what kind of experiments were they doing? Well, everyone should read my book, Tripped, because I lay it out in great detail. But Perfect. let me, let me give away something, you know. <laughs> um, 
I mean, it's very, it's a big program and it's a very weird program. And I wanted to actually find out everything we know about it and lay it out in trips. Problem is that a lot of documents were destroyed by the CIA in the seventies, but some documents survived because they had been stored in a different location at the headquarters of the CIA headquarters than in Langley and still in Langley. Um. So it's, it's a big program, but I mean, one of the things, uh, that, uh, are hard to forget, uh, the so-called faith houses, um, one apartment was on Bedford street in the, in Greenwich village in, in, in Manhattan. And one apartment was on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. And these apartments were furnished kind of like party apart or like bachelor or like bohemian apartments. Mm-hmm. And, but they had two way mirrors and, um, apartments next door that were also being rented by the CIA where a, an agent would sit and then record, photograph and, um, sound record what was happening on the other side when people were being lured up from streets with the promise of maybe a party and a free drink or let's, you know, let's, you know, make a party. Um. I have martinis, uh, so. Uh, oh, they had martinis, martinis, all right. <laughs> yeah, they had, in San Francisco, the, the document shows that they actually had martinis. In, in, in New York, it doesn't say what they were drinking, but yeah. it was certainly laced with LSD. Man. And then they would, you know, look, so they, those unwitting American citizens, they were just going out for having fun at night in, in Manhattan or in San Francisco, suddenly they were in a, an apartment with a friendly guy, suddenly the friendly guy, like everything turns weird. And like, I mean, it's a challenging experience. Um, so that, that's part of MK ultra. Also, they were using, um, universities to conduct. I mean, a lot of when NSD came out in the fifties, um, it was examined by a lot of neuroscientists. It was a very promising molecule. That could maybe tell us a little bit about what's going on in the brain. I mean, to, today we know quite a bit about the brain because of psychedelics, because we can see if we put, um, brains on LSD or psilocybin, you know, people under scanners, we can see how, dif- how different brain parts are being activated and yeah. where the, where the neurons, uh, fire and, you know, we see that they fire more. And so it's quite interesting. Um. That's why, you know, psychedelic molecules are very promising because they're actually uh, very stimulating. They're like sports for the brain or yoga or Pilates for the brain. Um, so that was, that this was like the legitimate, um, NSD research that was being done, but there was also the, uh, maybe you could call it spiked LSD, uh, research that was done by the CIA when, where they caged, uh, neutral well, not neutral, but neutral seeming foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation, let's say 200K uh, for LSD research that then the Rockefeller Foundation would funnel that money to, let's say, New York's Columbia University. They would get money from the Rockefeller Foundation to do LSD experiments, uh, checking out how LSD, for example, could interrupt the ego of a person or... Does it increase the fear level? Does it decrease the fear level? Like stuff like that. And university would, you know, think this is you know, good research in a way, but it was all influenced by, by Sidney Godley, who got all the results uh, on his table and uh, through the years was able to have a pretty good understanding of how LSD could be used as a weapon. But uh, actually he, he found out it couldn't be really used as a weapon. The U.S. never really developed an LSD weapons program. They tried to, but uh, Godley in the end kind of concluded LSD is, to- is something totally different. I mean, he took LSD himself because he wanted to see how it works and he concluded he can think much better on it. He has new perspective on things. So that is actually what LSD does. So that if you give someone LSD without that person knowing, it's a, it's a bad situation for that person yeah. because the person doesn't understand why the brain certainly functions differently. So the person might think he's going, he or she's going insane. So it's a great drug if you take it wittingly and if you know what you're doing and if you have a certain task, it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous thing if someone gives it to you. So that's very unethical, basically. Yeah. And I know you've talked about <clears throat> LSD and a potential treatment for 
Alzheimer's. And you talked about actually giving some to your elderly mother. And I'm just curious what the results of that were. The first signs that it might be helpful, I found in a white paper by an American startup company um, that did tests with low dosages of LSD on Alzheimer patients. And um, they found um, that the LSD molecule, um, well, it, it talks with the very same receptors, the five HT2A receptors in the brain that degenerate under Alzheimer. And these are the receptors. If, if you take LSD, like a lot of these receptors are being touched by the molecule and then the neurons, they kind of get stimulated and they start firing. So your brain is like, like a lot going on in your brain on LSD. Uh, and Alzheimer does kind of, kind of destroy those receptors. So there's less and less connectivity basically. Um, so I discussed this with my father, who's a former judge in Germany, quite a high, he had been quite a high judge in the system and who had sent people to prison for drugs because Germany is also, you know, we don't call it war on drugs, but we're basically following the same prohibitionist, uh, 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 drug law that America in a way, you know, made world standard in the late sixties and the early seventies. By making, you know, by bringing them to the United Nations and then, you know, be, they become mandatory if you want to receive, you know, if you want to be part of the club, you have to basically yeah. sign the same on anti-drug law. So, um, he was a bit reluctant in the beginning, um, but he read the paper. I mean, he's an intelligent man, so he's like asking the very reasonable question of why, if this is so promising, can I not buy it in the pharmacy? Why is it illegal? It doesn't make sense, you know? So I researched the story, which is the story of my book, Trip, you know, that what we talked about, the Nazi connection, the CIA, so we understand that, you know, LSD is not in the unit because it's dangerous. I mean, it's a potent substance, so it should be used for care, obviously. But that's not the reason why it's illegal. Toledo because uh, once the CIA was not able to utilize it, it as, a, as, a, as, a, as a truth drug or pharmacological weapon. Uh, at that time in the 60s, it had spilled over into the civil society of the United States, the American counterculture, the anti-Vietnam War movement. Yep. Was using a lot of LSD. People were just, you know, Tim Leary said, take LSD, drop out, don't be part of that system that's just killing people. So... It became a problem for the U.S. government and Lyndon B. Johnson, who had been kind of a, you know, he had been, you know, waging war in Vietnam. So he was not very happy that his population, you know, turned against this war in the million. So LSD was outlawed. So it was outlawed for not, not for health reasons, but for political reasons, you know, which is in a way, I think quite dangerous, actually, that some, something that could help us against dementia have been outlawed in the late 60s and the mid 60s, 66. Um, and uh, basically stopped uh, neuroscience for half a century, 50 years until in 2015 at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, the first uh, experiment had, had, had been, you know, picked, the experiment had been picked up again and uh, a professor found that psilocybin it's helpful against treatment resistant depression. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, you can like, by now we can actually understand what is happening in the brain because in the brain of psychedelics, uh, and this you can measure, um, looks at unpleasant memories less off, less intensely than a no, a sober brain. Uh, like you, you on psilocybin, on psychedelics, you tend to, uh, look at your positive memories more. And also depression is something, uh, is, it's basically a rumination. It is a thought that reoccurs, that you're not worthy or a trauma, something happened. Like you're always, you're caught up in a loop. You can't get out. That kind of becomes a habit to think negatively and, uh, psychedelic disrupt that, that ruminate, that ruminating state. Um, by giving less energy to the default mode network that creates these ruminations and enabling through the neuron uh, go, uh, 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 firing in other parts of other regions of the brain to kind of re, you know, reorganize itself without that uh, 
depression, addiction, etc. That's why also LSD and psilocybin are good good against addiction. Um, so all of this, uh, um, all of all of all of this is basically what I came back to my father with the story, and and then he you know decided to communicate with my mother, and they decided to try microdoses of LSD with her, and he also took the, took them. And still does, and um, the effects are quite good. Um, I mean, my father spoke of a medicinal miracle at one point when my mother would suddenly pick up the newspaper and read the newspaper, and she hadn't even looked at the newspaper for about a year because, you know, the other time she doesn't yeah. read anymore, but then she, she read again. She talked uh, much better. She talks much better when she's on LSD. She's not on an LSD every day, but once in a while she gets a microdose and that kind of her cheeks get redder. She's like more interactive. She's more happy. I don't know if that works for other people, but uh, certainly works in my family. And I, I actually have heard it from other people as well. Um, in Australia, it just become legal. I think in two thousand twenty-four, uh, early this year, um, that uh, also dementia patients receive legally from a doctor, from a therapist, LSD. Hmm. So it's uh. I can not, I, I would, I mean, I, I probably can't recommend it because it's an illegal drug, but we used it and we're happy. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's interesting. It, I have coming from a, a military background. I have a lot of the things you mentioned for one addiction, depression, not speaking uh, specifically of myself, but I come from a cohort of people that I have physically watched them suffer specifically with Addictions, uh, oftentimes alcohol, which can lead to other substances, depression for sure, post-traumatic stress. And I've watched over the years people trying to navigate that and work their way through it through the legal systems in the U.S. And the biggest mm. impact I have seen, and I'm not saying that this is a, a fix-all and that there aren't complications, but the biggest impacts I have seen are people that have to leave the U.S. to seek treatment. And largely it's through Ibogaine, Ayahuasca, 5-MeO-DMT. I have heard of people using psilocybin. I have not heard yet of them using LSD. Um, not that that's not happening. I may not know about it. But the impacts have been profound. Some of these people have come back. They look, mm. they look differently. It is as if they have a different... Uh, I want to say aura because that's probably the best description that I can think of. And not, not in like a religious, like glowing angel sense, but they just, you can see and look into their eyes that it has had an immense difference. And it it's, it sucks to see them having to leave our country to seek out these treatments, even though there is a cascading tidal wave of evidence building that it could be one of the most impactful and effective things that they could do to help deal with these issues. It's rough to watch. Yeah, I mean, especially ibogaine seems very promising. Yes. So um, let's hope that the new administration um, will legalize uh, these types of therapies. And if we can believe what RFK has announced, then this is exactly what will be done because he said he will stop the restrictions against psychedelics. And I think it's very important that the pressure comes out of the military, out of the veterans' organizations, because they are very important in the United States. I mean, these men have fought and risked their lives for the country, and now they're suffering, and the country should help them. In a way, you know, to sum it up in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, so, um, I, I, I'm actually quite hopeful that the change will happen. I mean, in the United States, I think the United States will be the first psychedelic country in the world. And I think it will benefit tremendously in the mental, in the mental health sector, obviously, but also culturally because the society that deals responsibly with psychedelics, I mean, it will immediately use less SSRIs, less, uh, opioids, less, all, all the addictive shit, basically, will be used less. And psychedelics, I mean, there was one study, I, I don't know which institution it, it did in San Francisco, found that neuron, new neurons can even grow through the use of psychedelics. So if that is 
true and they found that, but if that is, you know, proven by other studies, it would basically mean you take psychedelics and you grow more neurons in your brain. I mean, you can basically, you know, just have to tell that to Elon Musk and you know, he, will, <laughs> he, will, he will go nuts about it, you know? Yeah. We don't just do the filmmaking. We do everything. We've taken a case study of over 30 projects that we've done over the past 15 years, and we put together what we believe is the most effective and efficient content funnel for brands. They need content on a daily basis. They need to be talking to authentic end users. We want your team to bring its most challenging problems and allow us and our team to apply our proven methods to your brand to take it to another level. Do you think there's a chance? I didn't realize that the U.S. is uh, kind of at the forefront of the regulation or the war on drugs. Do you think there's a chance if the U.S. let's say RFK is able to get uh, able to deliver to the promises that he's talked about? And I am aware of studies in the U.S. There's a couple studies that I know of where they are looking at ibogaine and ayahuasca, which I believe, and I'm not an expert in the process, but I believe those as the first steps towards making it somewhat semi permissible. But let's say. RFK is able to uh, to work some magic, and it does enter into the legal realm. Do you think countries like Germany would follow suit, or what would it take for your own country um, to switch it from something illicit to legal? Well, it's important for a drug to be legalized that had been illegal before that there's a wide acceptance in the population. Mm -hmm. So in Germany, for example, marijuana, well, Cannabis, we should say marijuana is a actually a propagandistic term um, coined by Harry J. Amplinger in the 30s to demonize cannabis because it sounds foreign. Well, um, can cannabis was legalized uh, now in Germany this year because, you know, the people just know it's not so dangerous, yeah. even less dangerous than alcohol. What's the problem? So then we can legalize it. So right now, NFT is still stigmatized in a big way. Um, you know, all these scare stories, you take LSD, you think you can fly, jump out of the window, like all of this stuff is still kind of very present, but slowly the discourse is changing. And I think the America is, um, at the forefront and if America changes, I mean, Germany is like a little brother of America, so whatever America does, we certainly talk about it and, uh, it would, you know, stimulate also the discourse within the German society. So. Also, if like, let's say the United States is really serious about it and, you know, also critical towards the United Nations, still keeping up those anti-drug policies, maybe the United Nations would, you know, change their policies and Germany could not change its policies alone. It would have to, it would have to be changed, I think, by the European Union. I mean, the country mm. in the European Union, they have some kind of sovereignty, obviously, but it's not so, uh, it's not so easy, but it would it would really help if the, if the U.S. would go one step for, uh, forward now. Yeah, I'm hopeful that, I mean, again, like I said, the volume of just this tidal wave of information coming forward and this incredible impact that it has had in people's lives. And and, and I say that acknowledging there, I, I actually know people who have tried those pathways and it didn't solve their problems and it, you know, created oh. some additional ones, which all medications oh. have potential side effects. Like, there's no perfect recipe or solution for anyone. I just hope that as a society, I mean, in the U S right now, I think three quarters of the States have metal, uh, have legalized marijuana, at least medicinally. And usually it goes in my, what I've seen it go medicinal first and then recreational, which is just at that point mm. in complete, uh, legalization. I, I would be shocked if by the next presidential election, it's not legal in all 50 mm. states. So progress can come. Right. It's just slow, but I hope it can continue because I have seen it have such profound impact in my friends' lives. I mean, the problem are pressing. I mean, the people are suffering. Yes. Who have oh, PTSD or whatever, depression, dementia. Not only the people are suffering, but also their spouses, their family. Uh, dementia is a, is a rising problem, is a, is a, is a growing problem. So responsible government, you know, also understands that if we don't tackle the rising, the growing problem of dementia, our health system will be, you know, as big, we'll, we'll not be able to cope. 
in 20 years. Um, yeah. You know, because it's a very expensive disease also, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't know of RFK that, you know, uh, if he's really, you know, going to deliver. I have no idea. I don't know this guy, but I. Nobody does. Uh, We're all sitting back wa watching, kind of wondering what uh, it's going to be like after January. How much, <laughs> yeah, how much he can really do. Because what he's trying to do is basically totally upset Big Pharma. Yes. And it's always been, you know. I think that was one of the reasons why these elections turned out the way they turned out, because a lot of people are very suspicious of, in general, what we call the system and big pharma is part of the system. Yeah. It, the system kind of makes it thick and unfree. That's kind of the, 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 the understanding of people or the gut feeling. And, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I I'm, I'm curious, you know, I, but I actually, yeah, I'm curious. Norman, we're coming up to the end of our time. I want to let you uh, enjoy your evening in Germany. What would you like to uh, close out the episode with? What would you like to leave the listeners with? If you're interested in my work, I would always encourage to read the book and not just listen to the audio book because reading is a great thing and it also trains our mind, not just academics. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you would like to take a deep dive into Norman's latest work on the topic we discussed today, check out his most recent book, Tripped. Thanks again for listening to Change Agents and Ironclad Original presented by Firecracker Farm. We'll be back next week with an all new episode.